James O'Hara. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great, Elliot. Thanks so much for having me. How about yourself? The pleasure is truly mine. I am doing really well, thank you. Excited to dive into our conversation. I feel that there's many different places today's conversation will go, but the first place I do want to start is your story and get to know a little bit about yourself first. For the listeners who may have not come across yourself before, who is James O'Hara and what is it that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a nurse practitioner. So in my day job now, I'm in a a private practice. I co-host the Gillette Health Podcast, and I really enjoy putting out, you know, no cost to consumer, great public health information, because there's a lot of information out there and trying to provide some clarity and some balance to the information, help people understand what's actionable. Um, But I guess how I got to this point, my health background actually goes all the way back to being on the patient side of things. So when I was growing up, I broke a lot of bones, ended up in a lot of emergency departments, orthopedic offices. Uh, I think at one point we're on a first name basis with the front desk at the uh, orthopedic specialist. (laughs) So I was on the patient side and one of those experiences was particularly impactful. I uh, had a fracture and ended up having a a rod placement to stabilize the bone. And after that surgery, I developed a complication known as compartment syndrome. So for the, the audience or someone who's not familiar with the terminology, basically you have such a large amount of swelling that you cut off the blood supply to the distal portion of the extremity. So if it's at the forearm, you cut off the blood supply to the hand. Uh, Basically within that compartment, you have swelling, compresses the blood vessels and the nerves and can cause permanent damage. Unfortunately, I had a uh, very good mother and a very good surgeon, one of which got me to the hospital and the other did the surgery and I didn't have any complications aside from some scars, which you know, kind of remind me of how lucky and and blessed I am. And that's sort of what steered me into medicine specifically. So I'd always liked the sciences, but that was such an impactful experience being in the hospital and and having that emergency surgery, I was like, oh, like, I think this is, you know, what I want to do. Then I went on to nursing school and started off in orthopedics, um, given my orthopedic experience on the patient side of things. And probably the most interesting thing there was the, the sort of mindset shift that you see. And I think that's something that's still really powerful. I try to capture that in all the patients that I'm working with. Um, basically, these people came in and they maybe it's a knee, maybe it's a hip. But they're used to kind of year after year that is getting worse and worse. And then their mindset shifts because they know, hey, I can have this surgery and like it's going to be like painful, but it's going to be a little bit better each day instead of like knowing that a year from now I'm going to have more pain walking than I did a year prior. So I think that was really powerful and something that really stuck with me. And then I pivoted into, you know, cardiology. So I was working the majority of my RN career in a cardiology type setting, taking care of patients who were having heart attacks, having strokes, having open heart surgery. And it just kind of struck me. I I don't know if there's a particular moment or just like the cumulative exposure to it, but realizing that, hey, these things are about 80 to 90% preventable and that people really shouldn't be having these events still given everything we know uh, about prevention. So that's sort of what pivoted me into prevention. And I guess the other side of my background and as it relates to fitness is I wasn't particularly good at sports growing up. I think swimming was my best sport, but that kind of peaked in uh, elementary. So I wasn't like a competitive high level high school or college athlete. But then when I was in high school, I sort of pivoted into weightlifting and fitness and, and following some of the social media things going on there, because that's something that you can get better at with not a large time commitment per day, but with a lot of consistency over time. So that's sort of, that's sort of how I fell in love with the sort of fitness and resistance training and bodybuilding communities, things like that, because it's something that you can, anybody can make progress and it's a lot easier to do that than it is to shave time off your 100 meter dash or an example like that. Yeah, and I also find with the health and fitness side of things, especially in the gym, is that you don't necessarily, at least, well, if you want to be competitive, it's a different story, but to actually be very good at weightlifting or training, you don't need to be particularly skilled or genetically gifted, whereas if you want to be an acrobat, for example, if you want to be a jockey or a football player, then you need something on your side from a genetic standpoint or maybe a God-given ability standpoint, whereas I find weightlifting is pretty accessible, and I think a lot of people can get very good at it with just, as you mentioned, that consistency over time versus any God-given talent or any natural genetic gifts that they might have been given. Yeah, and it can 
it can snowball into a positive effect on someone's health and their their body image. There's just so many things that I like about it, and you can see that progress, you know, very rapidly. I think anyone that has like gotten into fitness and started lifting weights, they uh, are always kind of you know reminiscing about the the newbie gains, right? Where you go in <laughs> and like the first two or three months you're training, you like seeing changes, lifting more weight every single time you go in. Um, it's very exciting. Yeah, and you mentioned that you had some social media influences when you first got started. Who were some of your influences when you got started with bodybuilding, some time spent in the gym? I was just thinking back so long ago, but uh, probably following you know some of the like fitness YouTubers, like the original guys, like you know uh, Thomas DeLauer comes to mind. He's been out there doing his thing forever, you know, putting out a lot of good information, and. Um, I don't know if I was I was aware at the time, but or if it was just something subconscious. But I preferred people who were talking about the why rather than just like oh like here's me doing another you know chest workout or or here's me like this is the food I eat during the day. But people that went another level deeper and there was some like intellect to it and some like evidence and like hey this is why I do this, not just this is what I do. So people that put out the like rationale along with the plan were the ones that I tended to follow. Sure. Yeah, I think we share some similarities from that perspective of our early influences on that front. And I'm curious to ask a question off the back of that as well. It's not often that we see people within your practice. I don't know if this is my lack of awareness or maybe it's the reality of what I'm about to say is that we don't see many people who do the work that you do on social media, you know, sharing information, sharing it far and wide and with such precise rationale as well to try and deliver as much truth to people to help them optimize their own health, optimize their hormonal health and everything along those lines. So do you think part of that is because you gained so much information and value from the social media influence in the early stages? Or is that something you've always had a passion to do? Because it's not often that we see it, is it? Yeah, I think that's true. If you look at the majority of healthcare providers, whether that's a physician, nurse practitioner, most of them are not like out on social media, they're probably, you know, head down in their day job trying to, you know, help as many people as they can in whatever capacity they're working in. But yeah, I think it's probably probably was influenced by seeing some of those things. And it's like, hey, these people really helped me. And then, you know, my goal uh, was like prevention. It's like, hey, how can we help as many people like be aware of these things from a prevention standpoint? And then sort of you have this overlap with like preventive health and then health optimization. It's kind of one in the same to some degree. Preventive is a little bit more of a long-term time frame. But yeah, putting out that information for people so that they, if people weren't putting out that information for me over a decade ago, I probably wouldn't have come across it. It probably would have been a much steeper learning curve in terms of health and fitness and all those sorts of things. So hopefully I'm doing the same thing and cutting that learning curve for people so that they can you know, improve their health faster or just be aware of some of these things from a long-term preventive medicine standpoint. Yeah, I feel you absolutely are. And that's my intention within today's podcast as well as to dissect a lot of your knowledge and deliver it in real actionable pieces that people can take away. And obviously a big thing that you're always talking about is people feeling their best, looking their best and living longer as well. I'm going to start with a really broad question. My plan is to start out here and zoom as far in as we can. So I want to get an idea of why are we not feeling our best at this moment? Why are we not performing our best? Why are we living shorter lives? I'm keen to get a broad idea of why that's the case right now in 2023. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is probably nutrition, the basics, right? So I'd say nutrition is probably number one the low level of physical activity just looking at a population level is probably number two and then sleep i don't know if it's truly number three but i feel like it's kind of underrated like people will tend to neglect their sleep it's like oh i can sacrifice an hour of sleep for this i can i can get away with it i'm young i'll sleep when i'm dead you know it's kind of a, a production based mantra that's out there uh, but nutrition like i think this was the healthy people 2020 guidelines where they look at like what's going on with population health and they have all these surveys what are people eating what are people not eating and people really like to attack the like food pyramid or now it's my plate uh, i'm not sure you probably have something similar there in the, the uk like hey people should be eating this and it's mostly now like you know fruits vegetables protein and then maybe a small amount of carbohydrate is kind of what the my plate looks like and it doesn't look fair. terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's not what people are eating. So if we look at like these surveys and the, the population analyses, 
people are eating like 80, 90% of people not getting recommended fruits and vegetables. Fiber intake is pretty abysmal, you know, maybe 10 to 15 grams per day. And then I do think one of the things that's become more popular now is the, the protein intake. I think that's going to be beneficial for most people, uh, especially if they're getting into training. It's going to kind of push the gas pedal on in terms of the progress that they're going to make. So I think that is a positive and a lot of people are more aware of that now. There's a lot of, you know, foods now that are like, hey, high protein or things that are specifically lower calorie and higher protein. I think that's only going to do good things for population health. But one of the interesting takeaways from this you know, chart that I was looking at is really the only foods people are eating with much nutritional value are going to be like meat and eggs. So if I'm telling people like, all I care about is your cholesterol, cut out your meat and your eggs, they're probably going to replace that with like processed grains. So like whole, whole grains get a lot of heat. It's kind of controversial. Some people do have like gluten allergy, like they have celiac, they can't eat gluten or people have wheat intolerance, these sorts of things. But really it's like 80% of people are eating too many processed grains and not enough whole grains. So you look at like Pop-Tarts and Captain Crunch and those sorts of things that nobody's fooled by the label that says, hey, we've got like 17 vitamins and minerals. It's like no one thinks that's a health food. We just kind of like rationalize it to ourselves. Yeah, no, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And what do you feel that the big thing is that's missing? Because if, realistically, if I ask a random person on the street now, if I was to go outside and if you were to go outside, we would ask them, what is the challenge with your health and fitness at this moment in time? They would say, ah, my food could be better. My exercise could be better. I probably could be doing a little bit more in terms of walking or doing some cardio or something like that. And they're like, maybe I don't sleep enough as well. So those three reasons are pretty well known. So what's the gap between people being aware of this and actually taking action on the things? Because if this won't surprise anyone listening today, right? They will know this, but there is still a big gap between people actually implementing the things that they need to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people are, and people know these things, right? It's just like I said, nobody's tricked by the, the label on the pop tarts that says it's sure. got these vitamins and minerals. Everyone knows that they need to exercise more. People know that sleep is important, but people just aren't like taking those steps to address it. I think in part because we are very strapped for time, people feel overwhelmed. Um, they feel like they have to overhaul everything all at the same time. And I'm more of a fan of taking very small actionable steps. So a pretty extreme example is a patient of mine, this is some time back, like they're like, hey, I'm gonna lose weight. So what do they do? They got rid of their couch and bought an exercise bike and put that in their living room. It's like, yeah, that's gonna work, but is that realistic for everybody? Probably not. So- Must be I mean, great for the family reunions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because there's so many social things where it's a, like a, a sort of sedentary environment or a food environment, etc. So, I mean, you could say it's about how bad you want it. It's like, well, yeah, everybody, can sell their couch or put an exercise bike next to their couch or wh whatever they need to do. But what are some things that are like small? So sleep, I mentioned, is another sort of underrated tool. Most people, they have a TV in the bedroom, which really shouldn't be there in my opinion. And that is going to have a negative impact on their sleep quality. They've got these, you know, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I watch TV and then go to sleep. That's going to alter your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous tone. You're not going to be getting as restful sleep is deep sleep. And if people have sleep trackers, they can do this experiment. You can watch TV, go to sleep one night, and then not watch the TV and go to sleep the next. And I'm almost positive that your heart rate variability, your resting heart rate, your sleep quality is going to be better when you're not getting those bright lights you know, blasted into your eyes right before you're trying to go to sleep. A sleeping mask is another great option. Blackout curtains, if you can get the room it's so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face that works but a lot of people like even if you have a blackout curtain you're still going to have some low level light there so using a sleeping mask is another you know great option i was sold on that once i saw the paper where people that used a sleeping mask versus didn't use a sleeping mask had uh, better alertness the next day faster reaction time those sorts of things and better sleep quality just using a sleeping mask and i thought it was kind of funny the way they controlled for that they wanted to be sure that it was the variable of light, that it wasn't just like, oh, these people like had a mask on, so the pressure or something like that helped them sleep. So they actually cut out eye holes in the sleeping mask and had people oh, no in the control group. That was the way that they controlled to see, is it the light or is it the actual mask? So I was like, you know, it's a pretty well done study. And I'm like, I'm sold. So I've been using a sleeping mask for quite some time now. And I think that it has had a positive impact on my sleep. It's much my wife likes to tease me about it, <laughs> but 
yeah, I think sleep is really underrated. That can be a great place for people to start because, you know, you do have to sleep, you know, every day. So I think that's a place to start. And then sort of the reason that, like, I, to, I guess to your larger question, right? So the reason that these things aren't happening is that the convenience of everything in society now is like, it's so much easier to do the opposite of what will lead you to the outcome you want health wise. So, and like we spoke about sort of the fitness community and, and bodybuilding. So like maintaining a very good physique, a very lean physique is basically the opposite of what society is sort of programmed, or if you call it like the algorithm of society, if you just sort of are, are coasting through life, you're going to end up the opposite place. So you have to be very mindful and intentional. Great example is the people in the fitness community who are weighing out their food, measuring their food. And certainly not everybody has to do that. You kind of have two branches. Some people like to be very meticulous like that. And some people like to do more intuitive eating. You just have to have some sort of feedback mechanism in either case to let you know like, hey, is this working for me? Is this not working for me? And then be able to pivot and change as, as time goes on to to get to the goal you want to. Yeah, I love that. And I actually haven't thought of it from that perspective before in the sense that the easiest thing to do is to become essentially overweight by circumstance more so than anything. If you literally just don't do anything and you go for whichever option is more accessible in life, nine times out of 10, you're going to buy the cheaper foods, which are end up going to be the more processed foods, which are going to end up being detrimental to your health. You are probably going to sleep with the TV on. You always have to go out of your way to do things right for your health now. Whereas in the past, it might have been the opposite of that. You had to literally go hunt for your food. And then that's probably going to be protein based. It's going to be minimally processed because you went out and got it. And I know that we're talking many, many years back, but maybe even like 50 to 100 years back, people would have been closer to the food that they would have been consuming as well. And that would have been the easiest easiest way of doing things it would have been okay well this is the food that we have access to which is only five miles away from home but now it's like well wherever it comes from from the world and delivering from uber eats is much easier than going out to actually get my supermarket shop and everything like that so it's actually harder in that sense again people have the expense side of things as well but it's almost easier to just go down the path of least resistance which actually leads you to being overweight and then having challenges with your health right yeah yeah absolutely i mean it, you really are pushing against the the grain of society to be i guess people that have a normal bmi now and bmi is not a terrific metric in terms of like how healthy somebody is but people that have a normal BMI now are the minority, at least here in the US. I think it's about 70% that are classified as either overweight or obese. So that's a, you know, BMI greater than 25. And, you know, we sort of have this back and forth with the health at any size movement. And I don't buy into that exactly, but I think that anyone can improve their health regardless of what size they are. Even if someone is not healthy on paper, they can be taking steps to improve their health and take it away as a positive like that. So not getting fixated on, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so unhealthy. I have these problems, but looking at like, where do you want to be long-term? Like, what are the steps we need to take to do there? And then sort of building out that plan. Yeah, absolutely. I've said before on this podcast, that I think the H in health at every size should be changed to happy at every size. No one can argue that you might be happy there, but there is many arguments to suggest that you may not be healthy. And it doesn't mean that we have to necessarily say anything bad about your physique or the way that you live your life. And like I said, you can be perfectly happy, but I think it's a little bit deceiving to tell people that they're healthy at that size as well, when we all know the data and the stats on obesity and everything along those lines. And you did speak about sleep masks being something that you have invested into. Are there other things that you think of that come to your mind when they're maybe more under the radar, things that maybe people don't use on a day-to-day -day basis that have a very large return on their investment when it comes to their health and their longevity that maybe aren't quite as normal and easy as you know just healthier food in terms of fruit and veg what are some other ones that you think of yeah so i think uh another really low-hanging fruit there is just not eating right before bed so if you have your last meal like three hours before you go to sleep your sleep quality is going to be better you know, like i i've seen this in myself if other people experience this it's pretty well established at this point but a lot of people is like oh yeah you know a snack before bed and you get kind of drowsy and then you you may feel like you're going to sleep better but realistically your body temperature is going to be higher because you're digesting all that you know another harping on sleep again here but um, this is important also for people who are i guess you know advanced weightlifters or powerlifters bodybuilders those sorts of guys or you know, even people that are on their weight loss journey that are overweight getting screened for sleep apnea if like hey you know your your wife is elbowing you in the ribs saying hey you're snoring or you stop breathing again it's like 
you need to get that checked out because one in the long term that can have some pretty significant cardiac consequences but it's also pushing against you in terms of like how well you're feeling, how motivated you are to go do that morning workout. People are gonna be insulin resistant when they have sleep apnea. Even if you have the same, like two people, all things being equal, same BMI, same routine, the person that has sleep apnea is going to be insulin resistant. Whereas the person that, like, even if they're overweight, they're gonna be less insulin resistant if you're looking at their non-sleep you know, sleep apnea peer that you're comparing them to. So those sorts of things, like time, is another thing that like people are like, oh, I don't have a lot of time. And I don't know why this doesn't get a lot of attention now. I remember several years back, the like high intensity interval Tabata style workouts were getting a lot of press. Seems to have kind of pivoted the other direction to like, no, you need to have your training like in this sort of low intensity or moderate intensity and, and do it for many hours per week. And I'm just happy if people are like hitting those benchmarks and improving their fitness. So if you can do a seven minute or a 10 minute high intensity style training. And that's all that you have time for or all that you can add in to start. Even if you're doing that once a week, that's a great start. So realizing that you don't have to carve three new hours out of your week to get some cardio in. So you can do some like high intensity, even low impact things. If I told every patient to go out and do hill sprints, somebody's gonna get hurt, right? So I, I like to recommend the stationary bike of some sort. Like people can get these on like a, a marketplace somewhere, yard sale. They're pretty affordable. And uh, so far, you know, knock on wood, I haven't had anybody crash their stationary bike and get injured. That's surely going to be one one day, but for the time being, we'll keep giving that recommendation. Hopefully that serves them well. And before we move on from the snoring side of things, at what point do you know if snoring becomes, obviously if it's stopping you from breathing in the night, but what point do you want to start to think, okay, this could be a problem because it's a, another one of those things that's pretty common among many, many people. And a lot of people wouldn't look into it as anything unusual or anything that could potentially threaten the state of their health. So there's a couple of clues that could indicate that your snoring is more pathologic or causing a problem versus being like you know, the occasional night where it's like, oh, you must've been like really tired. You were snoring a little bit. If someone has high blood pressure, um, that's a pretty good clue. Like you know, if someone's relatively healthy and has high blood pressure, they should probably get a sleep study just to rule out sleep apnea causing that high blood pressure. Sometimes these things just get treated with blood pressure medication and there's really a, you know, a simple reversible cause there. Now, if someone has daytime fatigue, like you know, they wake up, seems like they can't ever get enough sleep, you're uh, it can be dangerous, like you're nodding off while you're driving, nodding off at a stoplight. If you are always like craving sleep, craving a nap, have to take a nap every day, those sorts of things can be clues that there's something more going on. But people can have mild sleep apnea and not have the sort of daytime somnolence, as it's called, where they just feel very tired all day long. So like, if someone has snoring and, you know, any one of those sort of clusters of symptoms, so they're waking up with headaches or the first thing they reach for in the morning is a huge glass of water because their mouth and throat are just so dry or they feel like their energy is low, something is off, then getting a sleep study is a good option. And there's a lot of good, like affordable home sleep tests now where you don't have to go into a lab. You don't have to get, you know, hooked up to all the headgear there. Uh, you don't have to go into the lab and have your sleep study done on the night that they're having a fire drill. That's actually happened to a patient of mine several months back. That's pretty horrendous. So yeah, definitely advisable to do the home tests as well. And we spoke about some things that could help with someone's health and their longevity. You mentioned some of the things that could be detrimental, TV in the room, eating late at night. What are some of the other very, very common things that we do on a regular basis that we might be overlooking that could be having a pretty heavy consequence on our health and well-being as well? Yeah, so I, I mentioned fiber earlier. You know, that kind of falls under the nutrition umbrella. Um, I think not spending enough time like outdoors or in nature and more so in like a long term, you know, time span. So it's like, yeah, if you're like, if you're extra busy, you know, one week, you know, one week not spending time in nature is probably not going to have any kind of a, a harmful effect. But in terms of like a society level, like the amount of time we spend that is just like sedentary desk work, not being outside, like even if you compare like the example you gave earlier, now compared to 50 years ago, that's a, a staggering difference. And I think that has some impact on the sort of mental health issues that we're facing in like as a public health challenge, you know, you see higher rates of these things. And 
I think part of that is is good and that it's like accepted now and there's less stigma and people are seeking out help. But I can't help but wonder like some of this has to be related to the you know the way that we're living our lives and you know the lack of time in nature. Like if you look at um, a couple of really interesting examples here, you know traffic noise. Like you can just put people in a lab and play traffic noise headset on, their blood pressure is going to go up. They're going to have more of that sort of fight or flight response because we're conditioned like, oh, you know, traffic is stressful, annoying, etc. You have someone go take a, you know, a nature walk or same lab setting, right? You have them listen to bird song. You're going to see markers of stress go down. Parasympathetic response is going to go up. And if you have people that are chronically like in that fight or flight state, then that's when you have people that say, oh, you know, I, you know I'm tired and wired where they're, they're sort of like, on edge all the time, more anxiety. And when you have cumulative stressors, that's sort of the recipe that leads to depression. So if someone is already on edge and stressed and then they have a like a major event or a series of major events happen in their life, then that's what can sort of tip the balance between someone, you know, just being stressed and then like going into depression and, and sort of the consequences of that. So I, I think that it's really important to be outside, you know, get that time, even if you're just going for a a nature walk on the weekend that can have some really profound impacts in terms of just you know the way you feel and kind of pushing that reset button so that you don't keep snowballing that um, that stress and, and building that up internally yeah i couldn't agree more and i think the irony is, is if you told someone today there's some magic supplement that they could take and they can order it from amazon is accessible in their country they would be very very quick to order that but when you tell them to go do a nature walk unfortunately even though it's surely going to be far more impactful it just doesn't hit home in the same way and i think the challenge as you mentioned when someone goes through one of those really challenging life events and it tips them over the edge is that i almost see so many people walking around with like theoretical buckets of water which are almost overflowing and it's only that one thing that takes them away from you know putting themselves in a really really bad position so i think that taking on that advice on board recognizing that it's probably more valuable than you truly think it is could be very very beneficial the one time that stands out to me and i hope that some of the listeners might have this experience as well as i went for a hike at some point when i was in mexico city and it had been a while since i'd been out in nature and i got back i had my shower once i finished and i almost felt like i'd literally taken a three-hour massage or something like that i was just i felt super relaxed i felt almost the immediate impact of that and it was something that has like kept my eyes open to how valuable that can be and it's so overlooked and so simple yet it can be so effective especially if you're in dire need of it which i probably was more in need of it at that time than you know than i would typically be as well yeah yeah absolutely it, it, exercise in general for some people has that effect and if you can sort of stack the exercise with the outdoor time uh, then it's, it's going to be more time efficient but you're also like I think getting some synergy there. So like an outsized, you know, one plus one equals three. So one, it's exercise, one, it's outdoors, and then it's taking three points off your you know, stress response, something like that. And, and kind of building up that stress resilience because we all want to be resilient and uh, really we just don't have the, the foundation there. And as you mentioned, supplements can be useful there. This is something that I find really interesting because a lot of times, you know, people will sort of build a like plethora of supplements that they'll be taking, you know, the medicine cabinet's full and then we'll, we'll sit down and do a consultation and, you know, they have maybe, you know, a dozen, you know, sometimes more, sometimes 50 supplements. And it's like, okay, what are you taking each and every one of these for? I'll sort of give them a, a homework assignment because a lot of times it's too much to go over each and every single one of those in a visit. It's like, okay, what are you taking each and every one of these for? And a lot of times people are like, oh, well, I really don't know at this point because they just heard about something here and there and then just started adding things in. So targeted supplementation, I think, can be very powerful. Random supplementation, kind of like spinning the roulette wheel. It's like, you know, okay, well, are you going to... What are you going to get from this? Are you going to get a supplements can cause side effects. Some people could be having a, a side effect that's caused by their supplement. You know, maybe they're taking a supplement for sleep early in the morning. You're like, why am I so tired? You know, there's all sorts of things and, and considerations that have to be made there. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I feel that with the supplement roulette as well, is that if you're taking so many, you really don't understand what's actually helping and what's actually causing the desirable effect as well because you actually are taking so many that you're actually like well is it this one is it this one and yeah i think it's really worth just taking a step back and like i said talking to supplementation is probably the best way to go
go. And then also for the money you're no longer investing in the supplement that's not actually helping you invest that into the quality of your food, the quality of your mattress or something along those lines is usually a recommendation I give to most people. And I want to transition now, now that we've looked at kind of health and longevity from a very, very broad perspective, I want to take a transition into hormonal health. I feel like a lot of people are kind of waking up to the fact that this is something that's not just under the radar and is just functioning without any influence of ourselves. And I think a lot of people are experiencing mental health challenges and all these other different impacts to their health, which they're no longer accepting. They're recognizing that, okay, maybe there's something I can do here, whether that be, okay, testosterone replacement therapy. It might be something along the lines of a woman go through her menopause and also looking into her testosterone as well as her estrogen levels and everything along those lines. So I want to, again, zoom out and zoom back in. So for anyone who's listening right now who wants to make sure that their hormone health is also in an excellent pace. I'm sure a lot of the basics that we've gone through are going to be the recommendations, but what can people be doing? Let's say maybe whilst they're in the early stages of their life, when they're in their twenties and their thirties, and also those who are coming through some of the more aggressive changes, maybe when they're reaching their forties and fifties, what can we be doing to optimize our hormone health? Yeah. So I think the example you gave there of menopause, I don't think there's a better example of just how much of a role hormones play in someone's quality of life and their health. And, you know, by definition, hormones are things that affect multiple body systems. They have multiple targets in the body. So, you know, for like traditional medicine to have kind of said like, oh, well, you know, you don't need to check that or you don't need to worry about that until menopause. It it seems kind of silly. And I think that it's really just because like maybe people don't know what to do with those results. And a, a test is only as valuable as the individual interpreting it and then the plan that's built around that. So a great place for younger people. You know, older people, wherever you're at, if you haven't gotten a baseline, great time to do that. So even if you feel great, you're killing it in the gym, like go ahead and get a baseline, you know, get some tests, you know, for men, you're not just like total and free testosterone, but looking at the uh, sex hormone binding globulin, people kind of have a set point of how much of this binding protein they have. And that's you know sort of the issue you run into a lot of times in older men and sometimes in this gray zone where men are in middle age and maybe they go get just a total testosterone checked. It's like, hey, you're at 600, things look great. But they may have this SHBG, this binding protein that's crept up over time and maybe their free testosterone is actually hypogonadal. So that would sort of be the exception to the rule, but um, sort of the, I guess the selection bias that I would see in, in my patient population of people that are actually struggling with some of these things, like a lot of the symptoms of low testosterone can overlap with depression. If you pick those specific people, they probably are going to have a higher incidence of something being off there. Sometimes, you know, people think they have low testosterone and then they turned out like get some blood work, turns out they're profoundly hypothyroid. It's, it's not a testosterone issue at all. Or maybe the testosterone is low because they're hypothyroid, or maybe they have a pituitary tumor. So you want to be like looking at all these potential causes, a great thing for someone to look at is like if they have a confirmed low testosterone, then going back, you know, checking it again, because you can have a one-off where you didn't get a great night's sleep or if someone gets their testosterone checked at night or after a large meal, it's going to drop a bit. Like that's going to give you a lower testosterone in the blood work. But then going back and looking at prolactin, which would be a sign of a pituitary tumor or iron studies to make sure you're not iron overloaded. Again, those can both be reversible causes, things we can fix. That's sort of your due diligence if you're you're checking testosterone. And it's not just limited to men. Actually, out of the UK recently, there was a paper looking at um, the benefits of testosterone replacement for women outside of libido. So these were just, you know, self-reported things that women experienced when they were on the testosterone. So it wasn't like, you know, a, a randomized double blind trial of any sort, but uh, basically, they had improvements in you know mood, in energy, and sleep, memory, and it wasn't like a hundred percent. So it was like maybe thirty percent saw benefit here, twenty percent felt like their memory was better. But these are some of the additional things. Whereas we tend to just think of testosterone as the libido hormone, but it really does so many more things. And I think the uh, the UK there may actually beat uh, the United States in terms of getting some sort of approved testosterone formulation for women. So there's been tons and tons of studies. And, you know, a fact that I like to put out there is at this point, testosterone is more well studied in women than Viagra was in men when it got its approval. So you have a lot of great long-term data, great safety data, and still no approved formulation uh, because people still kind of think of it as, oh, it's, it's the male hormone or all it's good for is libido. 
um, those sorts of things that kind of the, I guess the stigma attached to testosterone itself. So getting a baseline is particularly important for both women and men, making sure you have sufficient, um, well, calories is one, and then dietary fat would be another. You know, if you're like looking at optimizing your natural hormone production, dietary fat sort of acts indirectly as a you know, substrate for that or a signal for that people's testosterone levels will tend to go up as they increase their dietary fat. Now, you can have sort of the you know, opposite effect if you're looking at a a woman with a condition like PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which on a side tangent is not a great definition because it's kind of a, a messy diagnosis in terms of the criteria there. But if they're on a high carbohydrate diet and they're insulin resistant, then they can actually have a higher free testosterone because that's going to lower their sex hormone binding globulin. So they may think, oh, well, I shouldn't go on a high fat diet because then my testosterone is going to go up. When in reality, in, in their case, the most important thing is reversing that insulin resistance so that they kind of restore that binding protein and are able to better regulate the delivery of androgen to the tissue. And there are supplements that can be like very helpful there and probably even more helpful in terms of like being targeted than some of the medications that are used in uh, things like PCOS. You know, not that medications are like always good or always bad, but you know, there's different tools that can be used in specific situations. And what type of tools would you say are going to be helping in a situation like PCOS, for example, outside of raising the dietary fat? Typically, it's a, like you said, like a lower carbohydrate type diet. You're going to have less spikes, less insulin production, which is good, at least in the short term. Like people, I don't like to overly restrict people. I think long term, people can build things out to a more well-balanced diet long term. And find out like, hey, what is your, like how many carbohydrates are optimal for you or can you tolerate? Um, but from a supplement standpoint, there's a lot of good data supporting things like omega-3s, myo-inositol with a little bit of d inositol like a specific ratio there of something like four grams of myo to maybe 50 or 100 milligrams of d inositol um, like drastically inhibiting that testosterone production, which for them is going to be therapeutic because it's going to help to restore that insulin sensitivity, restore normal menstrual cycles, get rid of some of the excess androgen symptoms they may be having, like hair thinning or acne, things like that that can be very harmful for someone's body image and that we certainly want to help people control. Resveratrol, but the dosages you would have to use are pretty expensive, so I don't find myself recommending that one a lot. Maybe if you try these other two things and you're like, I, you know, I still want to do something, you know, still want to you know, stay in that sort of natural realm, then you can do something like that. Like your serotro, I think it's something like a thousand milligrams is what's been studied there. And usually the supplements you're looking at are like a hundred, maybe 200 milligrams. And like I said, pretty expensive. So always trying to be mindful of like people's resources. There are some topical uh, formulations that have anti-androgenic activity. Uh, there's like uh, ketoconazole shampoos that have been used for some time for like sort of global hair thinning. It's actually an antifungal shampoo originally, but it has some anti-androgenic activity in the scalp. Um, there's topicals like topical spironolactone. So a lot of women that have PCOS or acne will get placed on like oral spironolactone, which is actually a, a diuretic, uh, specifically a potassium sparing diuretic. So it can be bothersome in terms of like, a lot of women will tend to run lower blood pressure so it can sort of exacerbate or make worse that where they may be like, oh, I, I feel more dizzy now. I stand up and I get lightheaded or and now I have to pee all the time or the potassium levels start getting elevated. So using a topical, you can kind of bypass some of those negative systemic things and still get that localized effect that you're looking for. Yeah, it's really valuable stuff. And coming back to getting your blood work baseline in the UK, if you go to your GP, it's pretty hard to get anything comprehensive on that front unless you genuinely have a quote-unquote problem you're going for an issue so if someone is looking to get their baseline hormone profile looked at what type of things should we be looking at we've mentioned free test testosterone mentioned prolactin l h i think you might have mentioned as well what other things should we be looking at on a hormone profile and how do we go about interpreting that or should we not even be interpreting that ourselves anyway <laughs> Yeah, always good to, like, if someone goes and gets these results and takes them to their primary care provider, generally they're going to be able to provide a interpretation of those to some degree. Now, there may be a case where they, like, they don't see the difference between a, like, high normal testosterone and low normal testosterone, just like they wouldn't look twice at a, like, a white blood cell count that's low normal or high normal. So if your white blood cells are at four or at seven, it really doesn't matter. But that can be different for like hormones. That can be different for 
your iron levels. Um, you know, you can have an iron deficiency without anemia that could be causing your fatigue, and, and that's your problem. You know, it's not a hormonal issue. So basically, you know, ruling out other causes, uh, and specifically for women, um, so we address when they should get the blood work done and what specific things to look at. Um, in addition to the testosterone, looking at progesterone, estradiol, and specifically day 21 would be the perfect time. Day 21 of the menstrual cycle would be the perfect time to get that blood work done so that you're catching that progesterone spike. You know, in reality, I have a little bit more flexibility there. You know, so we're assuming if someone has a normal 28 day menstrual cycle, you know, day one is the first day that they start bleeding. Then between days 19 and 23 are going to give you a pretty good idea of, of where your progesterone spike is. And, and the reason that can be significant is if you have a woman and even their 30s, but definitely in the 40s, a lot of times you can see that progesterone level start to fall off before their production of estradiol does. Same thing for the testosterone. So maybe their testosterone level starts to fall off, but they've still got plenty of progesterone and estradiol production. So that can be a consideration, you know, again, the timing and, you know, almost always we're having people get the blood work early morning, well hydrated, empty stomach. You know, some people are like, oh, I didn't have anything to eat or drink. And then they go in and they're dehydrated. It's not a great experience for getting the blood drawn. Um, so I always emphasize like well hydrated, but yeah, not uh, having like a big breakfast and then going in. Some other things people might consider that are sort of outside of like uh, how you're feeling now sort of range. But, you know, like, like I mentioned, the iron levels, that's something that people can accumulate too much iron, especially if they have certain genetic tendencies. Looking at uh, genetic markers, things like uh, homocysteine or lipoprotein little a. Lipoprotein little a at this point is kind of a one and done. You check it once, see if you have this atherogenic lipoprotein that could speed up the process of atherosclerosis, plaque buildup in the arteries. And if you do have that, then you want to be more aggressive with lowering things like the LDL, the ApoB, the exercise, assuming all those foundational things are still in place, right? And then the homocysteine is sort of the more important piece in my mind. I don't know if you've had anybody on that talked about like the MTHFR mutations and and methylation. These are SNPs in two genes that drive methylation in the body. And the homocysteine is the endpoint that I care about. So I, people will tell me that I have this mutation or that mutation, and I'm checking a homocysteine on most people regardless, because I want to see is that at a good level. So the, the most compelling data for me is not the sort of correlations you see with like heart disease, because there are some correlations there. You can't say direct causation. But with the, like, looking at long-term cognitive outcomes. So one of the good studies there is older adults, they stratified them by their homocysteine levels. And they found that if you had an elevated homocysteine and it wasn't even a abnormally low B12, it was something that was in like the lower third of the range, then those individuals had a like greatly increased rate of brain atrophy. So like high homocysteine, low B vitamin, definitely bad. Uh, we're all going to lose a little bit of brain mass, but you want to hold on to as much as you can. So for that reason, I think it's another great test for people to to check. And then the way you fix that is, is fairly simple. I mean, creatine can be helpful a little bit there. Uh, and then adding in the like methylated B vitamins, even regular B vitamins will lower it to a degree. It just seems like the methylated versions based on the data and, and patients we've treated and we see that pull down the homocysteine level and, and our goal is to have that level below nine. Long story short, basically we shouldn't be interpreting ourselves probably because we're not going to see half of the things like someone like yourself will see. But I think as you mentioned, like a good place to start is just having those baseline numbers, kind of getting an idea of knowing the difference between a high normal and a low normal as well, because I think the how you feel scale is probably the most important thing when it comes to hormones as well. Because realistically, if on paper everything looks good, but you're not feeling good, then there's something else going on there that could be looked at and should be looked at as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you've given that perspective as well. And one thing that I'm hearing a lot about recently and is on the minds of many people as well as hormone disruptors, the things that we come across on a day-to-day -day basis, the plastic bottles, the receipts and all those type of things. How important are they in terms of actually taking those things seriously versus how much of that is us overthinking that these things are actually more impactful than they actually are? Yeah, so it is something that I think about in terms of like hormone disruptors, probably the biggest one out there is going to be obesity. Not not talking about the environment, but talking about what is having the largest effect on like hormone dysregulation at a, a population level. But to your to answer your question about these things in the environment, some of the preclinical 
literature there seems to have a pretty profound effect. There are certainly cases of this sort of indeterminate, like, why does this person have like, low levels of testosterone? They're doing everything right. They're not under eating. They're not overeating. Uh, their pituitary is putting out a normal amount of gonadotropins. Their Latex cells are just like they're responding appropriately. Like the pituitary is detecting a deficiency. It doesn't look like it's testicular failure. But there's sort of these gray area cases. And to be honest, I don't know if endocrine disruptors are affecting that in the population level to a large degree. But if the question is, would I rather have like more or less BPA in the environment? The answer is always less. And again, the industries that have sort of phased these things out, they're not particularly well regulated because the industry is always going to be a couple steps ahead of the regulatory bodies, if there are any. So even though like your water bottle is plastic and now says BPA free, we don't really know if the like new plastic or whatever is being used there is like a hundred percent safe. Basically I tell people don't overthink it, but don't go out of your way to heat up everything you're eating in plastic. Just kind of have a balance, do what you're able to do. And I still think the best defense against endocrine disruptors and like basically any insult to the body is going to be exercise. If you know you're going to be exposed to these things like endocrine disruptors and glyphosate, which again, we don't know necessarily like short term, it seems like there might be some small effects or even a neutral effect. Long term, I think there's still a question mark there. And would you rather have more or less of that stuff in your food supply? The answer is probably less just having things as natural as possible. But your best defense is going to be exercise and some of these foundational things that we've gone back to. So, I mean, there's all sorts of things there in the environment. There's the pharmaceuticals that are in like the water supply that I don't think it's clear at this point can be filtered out. I mean, there are very minuscule amounts, but again, we're sort of being exposed to all these things. And there's even some thinking in the, I guess, in the obesity medicine field that there's some sort of a like a metabolic toxin or some substance that has acted at the level of the hypothalamus that's disrupted our satiety response and that that's maybe not the contributing factor but a contributing factor to like what's what's going on at the population level and, and why people are gaining weight again it, it does come down to the calorie balance it's a very simple answer at, at first hand again there's so many different factors that go into that and there may be some evidence there someday right now i don't think there's a compelling case to say that oh this is exactly like the reason that we're having these like widespread population issues and hormones are dysregulated, et cetera. But it is something that I think about and something that like, yeah, we should probably do our best to avoid things like the receipts at the store that they get printed off. So definitely don't lick it. Don't rub it in your hands. Don't do anything like that doesn't make sense to do. But if someone hands you a receipt, if someone hands me a receipt, I'm not like freaking out saying, get that thing away from me. I don't overthink it, but it is something that I do think about and think, at some small level has to contribute to, like, even if it's not every case, there's probably a case out there of someone who is particularly sensitive or susceptible to these things where it has caused an issue because just because something doesn't happen to 50% of the population doesn't mean that there's not a single person out there that's had an adverse effect of something. Absolutely. And what I was just thinking, as you said that, is that if someone is experiencing some challenges with their hormones, maybe they're experiencing low testosterone and everything that comes along with that, maybe it's a good idea, like you said, to stop heating up every single thing that you eat in plastic. Maybe it's a good idea to maybe not work out the, che the checkout in the store, handing everyone their receipts, or at least put some gloves on or something along those lines. Obviously, there's going to be people who are more susceptible than others and it definitely makes sense that if you feel that you're within that realm then probably a good idea to avoid those as much as possible and one of the last questions i have for you today is because we've covered a lot from a very foundational level which i'm super pleased about as well is supplementation we haven't spent a huge huge amount of time going in depth there and when it comes to hormone optimization i know this is going to be a very broad question but if we are looking from a very very baseline level to look after ourselves maybe we're a man who want to keep our testosterone in the best possible place or maybe we're a woman who is approaching menopause and wants to make sure that everything is as in equilibrium as it can possibly be from a hormone perspective what type of supplementation should we be looking at that can be kind of generic is the word i want to look for in a sense of why what can we use as baseline supplementation without getting too specific into whether we have specific problems or not yeah so if someone let's say they have a normal testosterone level and they want to like augment that for whatever whether it's exercise recovery or libido or they're trying to improve energy levels these sorts of things 
from a natural perspective, the the, the Tonkata Lee is probably the most well established in in terms of the literature and having the studies to support it. And the the dosage there is somewhere between usually 400 to 800 milligrams, assuming that it's a two percent uricominone extract. So. People may see some supplements that are like 80 milligrams and think, oh, well, that's a weak one. I, I don't want to get that. I'd have to take 10 pills or, or maybe they take 10 pills of that one, but it's actually standardized to be a, a higher percentage extract. So those are that's something to be mindful of. The reason I say that's a pretty compelling case to be made for natural optimization is that it's worked in younger men, in older men, and in women. There's studies to support increases in testosterone in all three of those populations. Something that is like sex specific would be DHEA. So for men, DHEA doesn't seem to do a lot for testosterone levels. Sometimes it can be used at higher doses to try and knock down the sex hormone binding globulin. If you're saying as well, you have have plenty of testosterone production. Let's see if we can just decrease the SHBG and then get more of that testosterone to the tissue and, and kind of resolve things that way. That's when it can be used in men, but in terms of increasing the total testosterone, you may see a statistical change there, but it's not clinically significant. It's not adding 100 or 200 points to anybody's testosterone. For women, DHEA can increase the free testosterone pretty significantly because they have less relative testosterone. Like testosterone is still the more abundant of the sex hormones in women, like more testosterone than estradiol. They actually have more DHEA than just about any other hormone, but you add in supplemental DHEA, and a lot of times the free testosterone will improve in women. And the caveat there, or where people need to use caution, is that just because it's a supplement, it doesn't mean that you can't have side effects. And DHEA is one that's a little bit more variable. So I have some people, some men, some women, that they take DHEA and they just feel like amazing. They've got energy like all day long, and, and they feel great on it. They don't have any side effects, and I have... Other people take DHEA and they they notice nothing, even if the levels are changing on the blood work, because that's a good way to check. Is that DHEA sulfate level increasing? And then I have other people where there's some people that don't feel anything. And there's some people that they don't feel any better. They just get like side effects. They just feel irritable and get a face full of acne. And they're like, this stuff is terrible. Why would anyone take this? So it's not laser sharp or not extremely precise because it can convert to either testosterone or estradiol in the tissue. And at this point, it's kind of difficult to predict who like would do well or who would not do well with that. Kind of hand in hand with that, people are looking at a lot of times testosterone to augment their exercise intensity or recovery. And there are some staples there, creatine being one of those. Omega-3s are a little bit underrated in terms of being probably not anabolic, but anti-catabolic. There's some data where someone gets an injury, for example, and they're in a, like a leg immobilizer, and it seems to have a protective effect using a high dose of omegas to offset some of that muscle mass that would be lost while someone's injured. So I think that can be a consideration. And then one that I've been reading a little bit about recently is capsaicin. So this is like the, the spice that is in chili pepper, red pepper, etc. They're looking at this as a, a supplement to potentially improve reduced or I guess reduce the exertion that people feel like your RPE. So like how many reps in reserve you have when you're lifting weight and then downstream of that, improving the anabolic response or hypertrophy response to that. So the data is kind of mixed at this point, but the data is like positive in at least the two studies that I looked at here recently. So people are able to like get more tonnage in terms of like they did squats 70 percent of the one rep max how many reps can you get in four sets and the group that supplemented with this capsaicin like pre-exercise lifted more tonnage and then there was a actually i think it was a six or maybe ten week study where they supplemented with capsaicin chronically and they actually didn't lift more tonnage but they saw a increase in strength and muscle size which was interesting because they thought it was mediated through like something in the inflammation pathway or the immune response to exercise. And their hypothesis turned out to be false. Like it wasn't what they thought it was, but there was still that improvement there. Again, this data is still kind of early. There's not definitely not as many studies as there's with something like creatine, which I think is the most well-studied supplement at this time. But I think it could be something that makes its way into like a, like a long-term, oh, this is one of like the, the staples, or this is something that is I don't think you'd put capsaicin powder in pre-workout. It'd probably have to be in a capsule. Otherwise, it'd be uh, spicy. Like a spicy. You'd have to have like a 
jalapeno pre-workout. A lot of people probably wouldn't like that. Some people would love it. <laughs> Some people would. I think they'll get a kick out of it. But James, this has been an awesome conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm sure the listeners have taken a ton of value. I want to ask you a final couple of questions. And the first one I have for you is, what impact would you like to have on the world with the work that you do? Yeah, I think just helping as many people as I can, not only individually, like working with these people as part of our team, but like just putting out information and really helping people to take charge of their own health, like empowering people, giving them the tools they need. Because a lot of people, they've tried things here and there, but what I always say is that maybe they haven't tried the right formula yet. So it's not that, well, nothing they've tried has worked. I always like to add that yet on the end there, because there's always more things that can be done in terms of the like lifestyle interventions, supplementation, like, you know, medications. I think there's like always room for improvement, like regardless of the state of health somebody's in, and you can always build things out. Like fortunately, people usually have a lot of time to play with. So even if someone's in their forties and fifties and they think, well, I, I've really neglected my health, it's definitely not too late for that person. You can still really improve your health. And I've, I'm sure you've seen this working with clients. And where is the best place for people to find you if they want to keep up the work you're doing, James? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram at James O'Hara NP. That's probably my home base in terms of the information that I'm putting out. And then I co-host the Gillette Health podcast that's on all platforms and on YouTube as well. And if people want to find out about the clinic and the United States here, that's GilletteHealth.com. And there's also an option for people to order their own blood work on that website as well. Because a lot of times, like you mentioned, it can be difficult to just get your primary to, to get a good comprehensive panel or, or what they may consider a full panel is not necessarily what that individual is looking for. And do you do consultations for those who are international outside the States? Not as of yet. It potentially, it would just be something like health coaching, but for me to do a consultation in the medical sense, it's kind of a gray area. So it's something that we like may explore at some point. But as of right now, no. Good to know. Well, James, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a super interesting and very insightful conversation. Yeah, it's been a ton of fun. Thanks so much for having me. The pleasure is mine. Thank you.